Welcome back. So let's now continue with an optimization. So uh, first, I would like to come back on uh, what was asked before and after the break on whether as a user of MapReduce, you can use it to optimize things yourself. And for example, um, somebody asked about compression, decompression, can you compress the data and so on? Um, you can decide to do it independently of MapReduce. You can decide that you store your data set in a compressed way. Uh, and then what it means is that whenever you call the map function or the reduce function, every time you decompress everything and then you recompress everything, right? So if you compress by uh, each, each value, this is absolutely something you can do. Um, even though there actually exists systems, and I think it might include some implementations of MapReduce and even Spark that we look at later, that automatically do the compression decompression for you. You can actually ask them to use some compression algorithm and they will automatically compress and decompress. So some of them can actually absolutely do it. But you are free, since as a user, you can put whatever you want in the map function and whatever you want in the reduce function, then you're absolutely free to do anything you want with the data. Um, but there is an optimization that MapReduce knows to do, and that is actually going to be very useful in plenty of cases. The idea is that in the standard implementation, if we don't have this optimization, we have this mapping phase where we do things in parallel, then we shuffle around, that's the spaghetti part, and then we have the reducer. Here I put the case where the reducer is uh, consuming the same key type as what it is outputting, right? So it's mostly going to be an aggregation. But aggregations, like if you just do a sum or a count or, a, or an aggregation on the values, there is actually a way that you can reduce the size of the intermediate data. I don't mean reduce in the sense of reduce as map reduce, but just diminish the size of the intermediate data. Um, and so the answer is yes, you can absolutely do that. You can uh, have less data flying around. Why do we want to do that? Because that spaghetti is actually very, very expensive. Uh, we tried to do it when we did the, 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 the Pokemons actually in the lecture hall with uh, some of your predecessors. Uh, the amount of time that it took between the two phases to hand over the intermediate Pokemon integer pairs, that took a lot of time. That took really a lot of time with people walking around in the lecture hall. So if we can have less data flowing around over the network, so this is all going over the network cables in the data center, then that's going to help a lot with, uh, with the efficiency of the whole thing. And the idea is that we can add an additional um, uh, step in there that's called the combine step. So what it means is that when we have the intermediate key values that are output by the map function, instead of directly storing them on disk when we flush and compact or directly shipping them later over the network, we pre-process them by pre-aggregating, for example. So if, you have, if you're computing the sum in the case of counting words or counting Pokemons, you can pre-aggregate the, the sums you already have if you see several times the same word, instead of outputting multiple pairs, just output one with directly the sum. It's a partial sum, of course, that's going to be the sum of what you have on your machine. Um, but then instead of outputting 10 key values, you just output one. That's an optimization. Um, what's very important is that combining is not a phase like map and reduce. Map and reduce, these are two phases of map reduce. Combining is not a phase. It's only opt an optimization. It's only something extra that is done when you flush and when you compact. When you flush to disk, before flushing, you're going to look for all the duplicate keys and aggregate them to, uh, to, uh, to less keys. The same thing when you compact. Once you have output several intermediate files and you compact them, this is again an opportunity to use the combine function to have less keys, right? So flushing and compaction is when you do it. But there is a consequence of that because when do we flush and when do we compact? Well, typically we flush when memory is full. Can you predict when memory is going to be full? No, of course not. It's just going to be full and there's no way you can know in advance. That means that the usage of the combined function is totally unpredictable. 
there is absolutely no guarantee if and when that function is going to be called. It's whenever we flush or whenever we compact, we can call it, no guarantee whatsoever. So we cannot rely on anything. Maybe it's not even going to be called at all. Maybe it's going to be called plenty of times. So you need to be careful when you as a user provide the combined function that it must be mathematically correct that no matter how many times it's called, the results are going to be uh, as expected. And in fact, in 90% of the cases, the combined function will be nothing else than the reduced function. You just recycle the reduced function as also your combined function. In the case of the sum, that's exactly what we do. If your reduced function is summing the values for the same key, then just use that as well as the combined function. Why does that work? Because addition has two properties. Addition is commutative. A plus B is the same as B plus A, because you cannot assume anything on the order of the, uh, of the, of the key values. So it's commutative and it's associative. Associative, associative means that if you have one plus two plus three, it doesn't matter if you first compute one plus two and then plus three, or if you first compute two plus three and then one plus, right? That's associative. And because addition is associative and commutative, we can actually reuse the reduced function as a combined function, right? There are other cases that you can imagine where it still makes sense to use, to reuse it as a combined function. There are also cases where the combined function can be different, but in practice, very, very often, this is what you do. It works with the sum. Does it work with the count? Can you reduce? Can you reuse the same one? Yes? With the mean? Yes, the max? The average? That's tricky, right? It's very tricky because you have to, you have to, uh, it, intuitively, it's very tempting to say, you know, we, it works for all of them. So the mean and the max, it works. If you, if you have the mean of the mean of the mean and so on, it's always going to be associative and uh, commutative. Average doesn't work because you would end up with the need to have weighted averages. Because once you have computed the arithmetic average of some values, imagine that you have now two surviving key values after the combined. One was computed out of 10 key values, the other one out of five. If you want to preserve correctness, you would need a weight, double the weight on the left compared to the right. The problem is that you lose that information when you call the combined function. So this is why the, for the average, it doesn't work. So you, you have to be careful that if you have an average computation in the reduced function, you cannot just uh, use it as the combined function. You would need some extra work for the average. For the average, you would need to also include the weight uh, the, the number of initial key values inside the value, and then at the very end, you drop it, right? But you would need to preserve the weights if you do it with the average. Um, count, I would intuitively have said yes as well, exactly like you, but now I'm thinking about it, have, uh, having second thoughts. I didn't have it on the top of my mind. Let's take an example of counts. If we reuse it, imagine I have three key value pairs, and I combine the first two with the count, I'm going to get a two out of that. But then if I do again a count on the first key value that was uh, combined from the first two and the other one, that's going to give me a two again and not a three. So that with count, you, you have to be careful that if you, if you want to count things, you actually need to use the sum. Because once you have counted once, then you need to sum the counts the, the other times. Um, so you need to be careful with that one as well. So basically, sum min max, it's all okay. Count and average, be careful. That requires a bit of extra care in order to make it work, right? Does it make sense? I would have said exactly the same thing intuitively. I just, uh, just uh, uh, realized. All right. Um, okay. Uh, so the assumption is also this one I didn't make explicit, but there is also the assumption if you use the combined function 
that the types must be the same. If you have different types, it doesn't make any sense to combine. That will not work. So there is this assumption that you have exactly the same key types and key value types, and then commutative and associative. The way this is formulated, the reduce function is commutative and associative, is a bit of an abuse of language. Uh, if, if you look at it really mathematically and formally, that's not exactly correct. That is the reduce function itself. It would be more correct to say the reduce function is based on some aggregation function that is commutative and associative. But you, you get the idea, right? And that's these are quite natural assumptions to make. OK. Uh, so this is the, the, the uh, combine optimization. It's, uh, it's really magical because that's going to massively diminish the amount of data that's going to get shuffled around. And this is super useful as soon as you, as you aggregate things. Um, all right. Then there is a second optimization that is kind of for free, so to say. It's this idea of bringing the query to the data. Because if you manage to make sure that the map function is executed on the same machine where the data you're actually reading is also stored, meaning that there is a copy of the, of, uh, of, of, of the block, a replica of the block on the same machine, then you don't need to ship it over the network for the map phase, right? Once you shuffle, then it's over the network. But for the map phase, you can be very efficient. Okay. Uh, and this together with the combined function is also great because since you combine already on the map, on the map slots, you do it very early. And that's, uh, that's also part of the same paradigm. But anyway, here's an example. I'm, counting, I'm coming back to counting the words. Now, this, these words are counting with, uh, with just putting a one in the map face, and then the reduce is going to do a sum. But in that case, since we use the sum, it's as associative and commutative. That means that if we combine in that way, like this, there is a group of three, a group of four, a group of four, a group of two, and we compress or combine these into three, four, four, and two. If you reduce after that, uh, that's three plus four gives you seven for lorem, and four plus two gives you ipsum, and that gives you six. So you see that it doesn't matter if you directly reduce, uh, if you directly reduce to uh, seven and six, or if you have this intermediate step of combining, that's going to work either way. So again, what's very important, to understand here is that mathematically, this is the logical way of looking at it. Mathematically, you can combine any times, any number of time you want without changing the results. Physically, what's happening is that this is part of the map face. This is on the original machines, and this is what's going to get shuffled around. This is on the other side. This is in the reduced face at the end. All right? For whom is that clear? And who understands intuitively that for some max and mean, you can do that? All right, very good. So this is, this is the uh, combine. Now, how do we use MapReduce as a user? There's plenty of ways. Um, first, you can do it uh, in plenty of languages. The natural language would be Java, because that's the, the, the how uh, HDFS and, uh, and uh, um, uh, MapReduce are natively implemented, right? Um, but if you don't like Java, or you, you want to use another language, that's entirely possible. For example, a lot of people like using Python. Um, it's also uh, easy to do, but uh, it's a different paradigm. So I'm going to show you Java quickly. I'm going to say a few words about how to do it in Python. That's called the streaming um, API. Um, don't be scared. You don't need to know Java. This is just so, so you see what it looks like. Who already knows a bit of Java? Some of you, OK. So this is just to give you a taste of what this looks like. So you remember that I told you choosing the map function and the reduce function and the combine function, this is your job as a user, right? You pick the map function, the reduce function, and you put whatever you want in there. Concretely, it means you can program it. So you can create a map function here that just does whatever you want to do because that's a program. So you can have whatever you want to do. And the way you output the intermediate data, because it's the map function, is this context write call. And then you can call context write as many times as you want. And every time you call it, it's just going to spit a key value as intermediate data. Right. If, if you call it once, there's going to be one key value created. If you don't call it at all, then nothing. And if you call it multiple times, then 
as many key values. Okay. Now you see, don't be scared, right? I'm going to say a few words. What does this map function take? You see that it takes a key and a value, right? Because I said this map function is called for every input key value. So every time you call it, you pass the key and you pass the value. The, the context is just for knowing where to write the outputs to. These, don't worry too much. These are just some types. For example, that could be integer, that could be string and so on. So don't worry about that, right? Okay, then the reduce function, it's exactly the same thing. You also implement it as, as the user of uh, map reduce. But there is a difference between the map and the reduce function because remember that the reduce function must be called for every uh, group of key values that has the same key. And it must be all of the key values with that key. So that means that when you call the reduce function, you just don't have a key and a value. You have a key, of course, that's the key of the group, but you have all the values associated with the key. And in Java, they just call it an iterable because you can iterate through all of the values, but that's the idea, right? And then you output back to the context, all right? And then what you do at the end is that you, when you uh, want to launch your job, your map reduce job, you're basically going to uh, say, this is my mapper class. So the, my own mapper would be the one you define here. Then this is my reducer, right? That would be the one you define here. And then you say, okay, my input is there. So you add an input path to uh, HDFS, S3, uh, blob storage, and so on. Then you say where you want your output to be. Do you want it in that directory on HDFS? Do you want it in that directory on S3? It doesn't matter, you just say that. And then you launch the job with that uh, magical formula here, but you wait for the compression, for the completion, and then it's going to be there. All right. Um, and if you want a combiner, if you want to reuse the reducer as a combiner, you just say it as well by setting the combiner class. Okay, I'm done scaring you with that because I know a lot of you don't know Java. Um, Python is fine too. Um, the way it's done in Python uh, is a little bit different because, um, you would need to write a Python file for the map function and a Python file for the reduce function. It's like a script. So it's a Python script for the map function and a Python script for the reduce function. What's going to happen is that this script must consume lines of text that come from, uh, from the, 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 what's called the standard input and must output back uh, the, the, the intermediate, if it's the map script, must output them back to the standard output. Who knows what I mean here? Who knows what the standard input and standard output is? Maybe not a lot of you, right? Because this is, uh, you're not computer scientists. Um, who knows what the command line, how you, have you already used the command line? I assume so, right? A terminal, right? Then you, you type things and then something comes out. Well, when you are in terminal and you execute some program on the terminal, um, you can give inputs to the script by writing things on the keyboard, right? This is called the standard input. And so what happens is that you can write scripts that are meant to be used in the terminal that will consume from the standard input. And then you do whatever you want with them. The standard output is the opposite. It's when you have a script that writes to the screen. This is called the standard output. So if you have a script that, uh, for example, cat is an example, cat is a command that writes to the screen the contents of a file. What it does is that it just reads the file from disk and writes to the standard output the line of the file. And concretely, it means you see them on your screen. And so the idea of this streaming API with Python is to let you in Python write these scripts that read from the standard input and write to the standard output, one for the map uh, script and one for the reduce script. And what's going to happen is that Hadoop map reduce will take your scripts and it will actually launch them in the terminal in that way. We'll just stream over all of the data as text and execute your scripts in that way. For whom does that make sense? Right. It's not so important. If, if you didn't quite get that, that's, that's, uh, that's totally fine. You don't re need to worry too much about it. Um, what's important to remember is basically that it's all about writing computer programs, being as a terminal script or being as a program in Java. Um, if this scares you, this is actually great because that's actually making my point. Um, 
This year, what I'm presenting to you, MapReduce, and then Spark next week, it's only part of the story. The end user, in the end, should actually never have to do that. You don't want your end user to do that. A lot of people cannot do that. And in fact, what's going to happen is that, as we will see in the last weeks of the lecture, we have much simpler ways to query data with these high-level languages. SQL is one of them. You can write SQL at the scale of your entire cluster. We look at another language that's called JSONIC. They are really easy to learn. And what actually happens is that all of this, as you see in the screen, it's just hidden. You don't even see it anymore because these programs, they are just written by some engineers once that automatically will create the map function reduce function but you will not ever see that. I'm still including that. Of course, I, I need to, you, to show you the entire big data stack. So this is why I'm also showing to you how MapReduce is working and so on. But the reason why you don't have to worry too much uh, if you cannot really uh, uh, um, write directly at that level, the map function and the reduce function, because when you are done with the lecture, you won't need it. You can directly use these high level languages, right? So this is why you don't need to worry too much, right? What's important here is that you understand the architecture of MapReduce, how the data is flowing, right? How the map files uh, occurs in parallel, and then you shuffle the data around, uh, and then you have the reduce phase in parallel and so on. You need to understand that the map function and the reduce function may be as mathematical functions that take key value pairs and output key value pairs, right? But again, don't, you, don't let yourself be scared by, by these lines of codes, because the whole point of it is that nobody ever has to write these lines of codes anymore once you have the entire big data stack with better languages. Okay, I just wanted to unscare you uh, because of that. Yeah. Okay. Now, I told you I've explained MapReduce um, probably three times, so I'm going to explain it a fourth time but I'm just getting more precise every time. But hopefully things will start adding up uh, in, uh, uh, in your mind now. Um, here's what I want to do here. If you try to look for MapReduce explanations on the internet, or maybe even with ChatGPT, I don't know if ChatGPT would do that too. It would be interesting to actually try that out. But what you will find on the internet is people who explain MapReduce to you with mapper and reducer. They say the mapper does that and that, and the reducer does that and that, and so on. This is a very bad way of explaining MapReduce. And the reason why you should not use the words mapper and reducer is that it's ambiguous. When you say mapper and reducer, you might mean different things. And actually, if you want to teach MapReduce using mapper and reducer, that's very tricky because you're just hand-waving and not really knowing what you're talking about, right? So instead, of saying mapper and reducer, we will say map task, map slot, map function, reduce task, reduce slot, reduce function, combine function, map face, reduce face. We're going to be super precise. And you will see that with that level of precision, you should have a clear mind on what MapReduce is actually doing. So again, my goal is to tell you, do not ever say mapper reducer, just always be very specific on what you mean. So again, I added a slide for that. You can try, I'd be curious if ChatGPT also uses mapper and reducer when it explains that. If it does, that's bad. Okay. So if you ever see mapper and reducer, try to think, okay, do they mean the task? Do they mean the slot? Do they mean the function? So you can just try to figure it out. Okay. So I'm going to go through each one of them. What is the map function? Well, a function is a mathematical thing. A function is some black box that takes input and gives you output, right? F of X, right? So a function that adds one, F of two is three, for example. So this is a function. So it's a mathematical function, the map function that takes a key value pair and outputs zero, one or more key value pairs. That's what a function is, right? A reduced function, that's the same thing, except that instead of taking one key value pair, the reduced function takes several key value pairs, but with the constraint that these key value pairs must have the same key. That's the reduced function, and the reduced function outputs zero, one, or more uh, key value pairs. So this is the map function, this is the reduced function. 
this is a mathematical thing or a programmatic thing, if you consider that this is a computer program to implement the mathematical function. For whom is that clear? Map function, reduce function? Okay, it's just like this F in mathematics. Okay, this is a function. Okay, the combined function, that's also a function, and again, very similar to the reduce function, actually, that takes key value pairs and outputs a key value. Uh, they just differ in when they are called, right? The reduce function is called uh, in the reduce phase. The combined function is called in the map phase, just before you flush and you compact. Okay, but this is just math. This is just math that transforms key values into key values. So that's map function, reduce function, combine function. Now, let's look at a map task. What is a map task? A map, map task is like an assignment or homework. It's something that you need to do. Um, so a map task is just the assignments that you have to call the map function once for every key value pair that you're receiving. So here I have three value, three key value pairs, key one, key two, key three. And my map task consists in calling the map function three times, once for each key. And out of these calls, I'm going to get key values, of course, whatever, zero, one or more for every call. And then I get uh, uh, some, some output sequence of key values that is the output of my map task, right? So a map task, uh, consists in sequentially calling the map function on key values. There is nothing in parallel here, nothing in parallel. Sequentially, I first call it on key one, get the three values, then I call it on key two, get values, then I call it on key three, get values. That's my map task. For whom is that clear? Okay. The reduce task looks similar. It's also a sequential series of calls of the reduce function. First, I call it on a group of key values that have key, key one, and I get zero, one or more key values, in that case one. Then I call it, after that, I call it on another group of key values, this time with key two. Then I get zero, one or more key values. And then I call it a third time, this one, this one on key values with key, key three, and then I obtain another zero, one or more key values. This is also sequential. There is no parallelism in there, right? So if you have a map task or a reduce task, it's just a series sequentially you're calling one after the other, the map function or the reduce function on some provided input. This is the map task and the reduce task. There is no such thing as a combined task that doesn't exist. There's only a combined function, but there is no combined task that doesn't make any sense, okay? So here it's already tricky. Because when people say mapper, sometimes they mean this. When they say mapper, they mean the map function. But sometimes when people say mapper, they actually mean the map task, right? So this is why you need to ask yourself, which, what do they actually mean with mapper? But if you say map function and map task, then it's clear what you mean. Okay, now this is how it relates to the combined function. Basically, when you have a map task, which is a sequential uh, sequentially calling the map function, you also call the combined function at the end, right, by, uh, by combining these values. All right. Okay, now map slot. So map function, map task, map slot. What is a map slot? Um, a map slot, you should think of as hardware. You know that in a computer, the computations are done with a CPU, right? It means central processing unit. This is the brain of your computer. So in the very old computers, the CPUs could only do one thing at a time, sequentially. Um, you could simulate that you were doing several things, but it was in fact just taking turns uh, between the, all the things you're doing. In the more modern computer architectures, you might have heard of four cores, eight cores. You know that, right? When you buy a laptop, they will tell you how many cores it has. It's as if your computer had multiple brains. It's actually able to, able to do several things at the same time, once per core. Well, if you look at a map slot, you should think of it as one core of your machine. It's a slot. It's, it's a brain that's ready to take over the task. 
So what does a map slot do as a CPU core? It takes care of map tasks. This is what it does. So if you take a CPU core, that is a map slot, it's going to first take task one that is received from the job tracker, okay? Then it takes care of calling the map function sequentially. Then it's done with task one, right? Maybe then it's in memory, maybe it's flushed on disk, but it's done with task, task one. Then it's going to proceed over to task two, which again is a sequential series of calls of the map function. And then it's done with task two, and then it moves over to task three, then does it and so on. It's also sequential. It's sequential within the tasks that you call the function one after the other. And it's also sequential across tasks, right? So a core, task one, task two, task three. Why is it sequential? Because one CPU core can only do one thing at a time. You cannot have a CPU core do multiple things. Always one thing at a time. Very important. So that's a map slot. Think of it as a CPU core. So now it should be clear what a map function is, what a map task is, and what a map slot is. A map function is a mathematical object. A map task is an assignment that you have to do something. And a map slot is computer hardware, is the CPU. A reduced slot is very similar. It's also on a CPU core, but now it's a CPU core that's assigned to reducing. And it just takes reduced tasks. So there's reduced task one, then it's done. Then it's output to HDFS. Then comes reduce task two, then it invokes the reduce uh, function sequentially. Then you write to HDFS, then you're done with task two. Then you go ahead with task three and so on. Again, it's a single CPU core. It can only do one thing at a time. So this is again sequential. Combined slot doesn't exist at all. There's only the combined function. So as you can imagine, people also use the word mapper for that. They will also sometimes call this a mapper, meaning they call the CPU core the mapper, because that's whoever maps is the mapper. So this is why it can be map function, map task, or map slot can be called a mapper. OK. But now you might be thinking, what's the point of using a cluster and parallelism if there is no parallelism at all? Did you see any parallelism here? There's no parallelism at all. It's all sequential. So what's the point of MapReduce if it's only sequential? The trick for the parallelism is that there are several slots on your cluster. There is one slot for every CPU core. Even on one machine, you might have 16 slots. If you have a thousand machines of your, on your data center and they each have 32 slots, then you have 32,000 slots, right? So what's important is that the parallelism is across the slots. All of these slots are processing tasks in parallel but within one slot, within one CPU core, you only ever process one task at a time, even one map function call at a time, sequentially. For whom is that clear? Parallelism across slots, but within a slot, it's all sequential. Okay, the same for reduced slots. We have plenty of reduced slots in that data center. Within a slot, it's all sequential, but across the slots, it's all done in parallel. And between the two, you have the shuffling. Combined phase, no such thing. So this is the map phase where you have the slots processing uh, map tasks in parallel. The reduce phase is when the reduced slots process the reduced tasks in parallel. Combined slot doesn't exist. The only thing that exists with combined is function. Okay. So all in all, this is what you have on your cluster. Here, there's two machines that I showed on the screen. I have in that case, two machines which each three cores. That I don't even think that exists three cores. It's just for the slide. I think it's either two or four or typically powers of two. Um, anyway, so here I have three CPUs on the machine on the left and three CPUs on the machine on the right. So I have six slots. And the slots are each processing tasks sequentially. And within a task, you call a function sequentially. In that case, that's both true for map and reduce. Why I just wrote slot, task, and function call. That's pretty much it. If you understand this, then you understand how things are actually going on. And in practice, you're going to assign some of the slots to map and some of the slots to reduce in a natural way. Okay. For whom is that clear? All right. So now, hopefully, things should start to get clearer and clearer uh, as to how MapReduce is working. 
If that's not enough, let me explain it a fifth time, this time with postcards. So you go on vacation with your friends and you need to write plenty of postcards to even more friends. So let's say you have, uh, this is all the people you're on vacation with. What you are going to do is you have 50 postcards to send. So you're going to split it into five tasks, right? Five tasks. Every task consists in writing 10 postcards, right? So you say, okay, the split one, task one. So what's the difference between task and split? Task is the assignment of writing the postcard. Split is only when you partition the data. That's the name of the, of the split. So the split would be one to 10, the second split 11 to 20 and so on. And the task you would be the task to write the postcards to friend one to friend 10. Okay. Uh, but there is one task for one split. That's a one to one mapping. Okay. So you have five assignments, five tasks, uh, and then you need to spread them uh, over the people. But you might have noticed there's five tasks and there's three people here, uh, even though one of them has some extra help. Um, okay, so since you have the splits, which are postcards one to ten zone, then you have the task that correspond to it, which is writing on the postcards. As I said, there's a subtle difference. And what you do is that you start, okay, you sit at a table, but you, can, you only have three slots in that case, right? So you just take the postcards, which you might have bought from the, uh, from the library. So a split is going to be a pile of 10 postcards. And then your first friend is going to write postcards one to 10 at the same time, because you maybe you bought three pens, so you can do it at the same time. Friend number two with the extra help can write on postcards 11 to 20, and then the third friend postcards 21 to 30. The other ones, they're just still on the pile in the center of the table untouched, right? Now, it's not working because probably it's out of focus. Need to click on the screen. Okay, so now, of course, you're faster if you have extra help. So these ones are already over. They, ha they are done writing on postcards 11 to 20. So that's it. You take another task, the next one, right? While the others continue with task one and task three, right? So now you continue on task four. And then this one is done, 21 to 30, and takes task five, right? It's sequential. You can only write one postcard at a time, right? And then they are done but there is nothing else to do. So now they are idle, they are just waiting. And then she's done as well, and he's done as well. Now it's over. Now you have the completed postcards, right? So this is it. So the splits again, let me explain with MapReduce, the split would be the postcards themselves. That's the actual inputs data, but, uh, but partitions. The tasks would be to-dos, it's assignments to, to write on the postcards. The function would be the actual writing on the postcard, right? On one postcard is one function. And then the slots would be each person basically. And on each slot, you can handle multiple tasks one after the other, and then you're done. This is the analogy. And MapReduce works exactly in the same way, except that instead of people, you have CPU cores, and instead of the postcards, you have data. That's pretty much it. For whom is that clear? All right, very good. So now a tricky point. Oh, is there a function? Uh, it was mentioned that the query is processed on the node where the data is, but how does that work with balancing the task if one node is heavily loaded because there's a lot of data and the other ones are idle? Ah, that's a good question. So indeed, this is about the load balancing. Um, in reality, Sometimes you're out of luck. And it might be that you have input data. And let's say you want to filter all of the lines of text that contain the word big data. If you're optimistic, big data is going to be evenly distributed in the input data. So all of the servers, they will more or less output the same number of, uh, of, uh, of KDU pairs. But there are cases in which you're out of luck 
Imagine that you're, you're processing a billion lines, but the lines that contain big data, they're all at the same location. There's plenty of lines without and then some lines with. So what's going to happen is that at some places of the cluster, you're going to have no work at all because there, there, there is nothing to, to do. And some other parts of the cluster, you're going to have a lot of work because this is where all is concentrated. Um, it can be even worse on the reduced side because you might have groups of key values where you have very few key, key values with the same key. And then suddenly you have a million key values with the same key. That means that there is going to be a reduced slot that's going to be completely overloaded with a lot of things to do. And then uh, some others that will not be overloaded. This can be partially compensated by the fact that the way this works is that as soon as you're done with a task, you take another task. Whoever is slower just gets less tasks. Whoever is faster, gets more tasks. So that helps a little bit to, to fight against this problem, but not completely. And you might still end up with situations where the load is not balanced evenly. And then it's up to you as a user to actually take care of that, right? But of course, if you have a high level language, then you don't need to take care of that because somebody did it for you, right? But if you're directly a user of MapReduce, then you need to take care of that. Did I answer your question? Awesome. So again, the key part of the answer is whoever is slower gets less tasks. Whoever is faster gets more tasks. This is the key, right? If you're super fast, you're going to get a hundred tasks if you want. If you're super slow, you only get one. Okay. All right. Now there's a tricky point. Uh, and uh, nobody asked, but I told you at some point, roughly, I said a block is roughly a split. That's because there is a tiny little difference between the two. So remember that we have tasks that can be map tasks or reduced tasks that corresponds to the split. We have one map task for every split. So now you know that every one of these boxes is called a task now. Uh, and uh, on the top, you have the splits. Every split corresponds to one task. So the task of calling the map function on every key value in the split. Okay. Now, very roughly, we say, okay, a split is an AGFS block, 128 megabytes. Here's the problem. An AGFS block is an exact number of bits. It's 128 megabytes. And then you cut and that's it. But the splits in MapReduce, they are not defined on bits. They are defined on key values. We also call them records, the key values, but they are corresponding to key values. So when you have a MapReduce split, the split ends at the end of a key value. You cannot cut a key value in two. You cannot do that. So the split has to end between two key values. The problem is that if you map it to the blocks, you might have a lot of key values on one block, but the last key value might not finish on the same block. The last key value might be in between two blocks. It starts on a block and finishes on another one. This is what I meant with roughly, right? A block is roughly a split except that the split goes a little bit overboard to finish the last key value in another block. And that means that you, you need a remote read, right? Most of the blocks will be on the same machine, but to finish with the last few bits, you might need to get a block uh, from somewhere else. This is why HDFS allows you to not get the entire blocks, but only a partial blocks, because then you can only ask for the, for the bits you need, right? Who understand the, this roughly, the fact that it's roughly the same thing, but not quite. It's again because the last split, the, the last uh, key value is, uh, is uh, very unlikely to finish uh, on the same block. It can happen, of course, but look at the odds of that. The odds that a key value is exactly going to finish on the last bit of a block, it's like winning at the lottery, right? If you're lucky, maybe one in a million or one in a hundred million is winning at, uh, at the lottery, right? So it's almost never going to happen that this exactly matches. So this is the reality between splits and blocks. It's roughly the same, but not quite the same. But what's nice is that MapReduce, so the, the implementation of MapReduce in Java will take care of it for you. So even as a user of MapReduce, you don't need to worry about these things. It's just a theoretical curiosity to be aware of, right? This is my last slide on MapReduce. I'm done. MapReduce is the first generation of data processing, massively parallel data processing. There are newer versions of this, newer generations, in particular Spark, and this is what I'm going to show you next week. Spark is more modern. It's slightly higher level. It's still complicated, but a higher level. 
and we are just going through up our big data stack. And again, at the end of the semester, you will even have high level languages that make it even much easier, right? Okay, so thank you very much for attending to this lecture on MapReduce. Enjoy the exercises also on MapReduce. And then next week, I'll show Apache Spark uh, to you. Thank you very much. Have a good week. See you next week.